All right. Yeah. Hi, 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 Prof. Prof. I actually have one question. Like, what what's the goal of for human to actually create the artificial intelligence? Hey, that's a good question. That's a very good question. And and, and also and also, what what's the goal for human to actually give a birth? To to actually sorry. But to give give a birth to, a to birth. have children, yeah, to, to children. have children. Oh, there, is, there is no goal there. It's something that pertains to being alive. By the way, the human being is the only creature on earth that can decide not to reproduce. The human being is so devoid of a pre-established goal, is so, uh, is so, uh, is so not predetermined, the human being, that is the only creature on earth that can decide not to, rep not to reproduce. Is the only creature on earth, by the way, that can have sex. All the other creatures don't have sex, they mate. The human being instead is the only creature in, in which reproduction and sex are fundamentally disjoint. Okay, a dog, when a dog mates with a female dog, it doesn't ma mate out of love, out of pleasure, out of let's have fun. The male dog mates with the female dog because the female dog is in heat and the male dog is hit by certain chemical particles that make him act that way. But nobody has ever seen a dog saying, oh, I love her so much, I'm gonna buy her flowers tomorrow. Nobody has ever seen that. Same thing about all other creatures. A small difference we find in big primates. We know, for example, that big primates uh, like chimpanzees, gorillas, and orangutan practice something like homosexuality. Now, the question is, do they do that just for pleasure, because they find it pleasurable, or do they do that to establish some kind of uh, hierarchical chain? And at the, if, 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 if the second case is true, then they don't practice sex. They don't practice sex. They do it because of certain, uh, or shall I say, certain directly functional uh, uh, positions in, in their society that they have to establish. Another point becomes, again, something that is not free like human sex. Okay. So that's how little the human being is the predetermined. In fact, I mean, one can, can go even further. And if one considers that nature, in a certain way, nature, appears as what predetermines all the creatures, meaning a dog does dog stuff and will, al and will always do dog stuff, right? I've never seen a dog being a poet. I've never seen a dog deciding, oh no, today I'm going to act like a cat. Okay? So dogs will be dogs, cats will be cats, Pigs will be pigs, uh, birds will be birds, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, but now, but there... this means that they, these creatures, are somehow predetermined. And that's what we call, we call their nature. A dog acts according to its nature. And the nature of the dog is that of barking, for example. The human being doesn't act in any particularly predetermined way. In fact, you have different human groups behaving in vastly different manners. 
Hence, we can say, as certain philosophers like Nietzsche, like Sartre have said, the human being is that creature that has no nature. But I mean, now we're going further into the distinction between living, living, living things, which doesn't precipitously interest us now. Okay. What interest us, what is of interest for us now is the fact that what Searle says that we are machines and that the other creatures are machines is untenable. Oh, can I okay. uh, yes. say two things? Uh, firstly, even supposing like that we accept the say the premise of theology, mm. could couldn't God have made us not any any functional purpose as well as, as you say as you say like a work of art? Yeah, I mean, yes, the, that's uh, a possibility. I mean, someone that uh, wants to embrace the, the, um, the hypothesis of the existence of God, like myself, for example, could say that God doesn't make uh, with a goal in mind. God makes like an artist makes. The problem, though, is that from the doctrinal point of view, if you are a Catholic, that is a bit controversial because it seems that God had in mind the history of salvation and the final salvation of men. So the goal of men is that of, of, of you know, being saved and being brought back to uh, the touch with God, to be in touch with God, which is a common belief in all the three revealed faiths, so in, in Islam, in, uh, in uh, Judaism, and in Christianity. So the idea of telos appears in a certain way also in these three um, religions. But one could say yeah, that God creates as an artist creates. The problem though is another. The problem is that in the building up of a philosophical argument, you cannot, you cannot use any assumption that you are not ready to make explicit, as Searle is not ready to make it explicit, and which you are not capable to defend with the, with the uh, sole instruments of reasoning. And when it comes to faith, I cannot defend my faith with the sole instruments of pure deduction, induction, uh, inference, and blah, 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 blah. I must say I believe because I believe. But philosophically, that's not enough. In other words, we enter in, in a completely different domain of thinking, which is not inferior, is not worse than, but if we stay within the domain of philosophy, we cannot accept, again, that someone rests on implicit assumptions that is not ready to make, to make explicit. And when you force them to make them explicit, they cannot defend rationally. At that point, it's not a philosophical argument. It's just a piece of very incoherent belief. Because at least as a believer in God, I know that I believe. I know all the difficulties of sustaining this belief. But I know it. As a believer in the fact that we are machines, I don't know that I believe. Because I take it to be an evidence. No, it's not an evidence. And evidence is that I won't cough in the morning because otherwise I become a very bad person. That's an evidence. But not that I'm a machine. That's no evidence. That's what you say. In fact, when I start perusing it, your saying doesn't hold. I mean, I don't want to uh, detract into a different topic, but even like... Uh... Sorry, I'll just say this I think, like very briefly, but I suppose like even in the realm of philosophy, there are ways to to show that reasonably that God exists and without using 
any any uh, assumption of faith yeah there are ways uh, you have the proof of the existence of god in uh, for example in descartes or in saint Anselm. Uh, what is the problem there the problem there is that at the point you're not dealing anymore with the god that the christians believe into you are believing with some kind of uh, uh, causal entity which is the fruit of certain ways in which the human mind can organize its thought. Once the human mind has decided that it understands everything through the uh, two concepts of telos, of goal and of cause, of efficient cause, then of course you must come to the conclusion that there must be someone that has caused all this to exist. Are you still dealing with God? No, you are calling God the first necessary principle that your way of structuring your thought forces you to come to. If instead I say that, well, look, what is around me in my own life have no particular goal. And you can say that. Then nothing forces you to say that someone made this. You can very well say, well, things are, and that's it. And that's a reasonable uh, conclusion, given the frame. The frame being things have no goal. Now, between the two frames, things have no goal and things have goal, the safest one to take is things have no goal. Because saying that things have goals is the result of the fact that we are that creature that does whatever it does with a goal in mind. I got up in the morning today at uh, 7.35 uh, and I started uh, cursing the computer at 7.45 instead of taking my coffee and trying to make the internet work because I wanted to teach. Okay? And later on, once I put on my shirt and I go out, I go out with the purpose of going to the cafe, sit there and study. And once I'm done there, I'm going to move from there. I have all my day planned, by the way. And I'll take the bus to go to River Valley in order to buy a certain kind of flower. And then after that, I'll do another thing, which I don't know yet. And I will reach 6.30. I will change in my uh, gym gear, my gym attire, in order to go running. And I run because I want to remain slim. And I want to remain slim in order to get always into the nice suits that I have. And I want to get into the nice suits that I have because I like them. And I like them because people, when they look at me, they say, oh, you're so elegant. And I want people to tell me that I'm elegant because, you know, it helps my ego, which is very big and it needs to be fed and blah, 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 blah. So as a creature, I live in a series of goals that I don't even enumerate to myself explicitly, but they're all there. My dog instead wakes up in the morning, eats and goes back, goes back to sleep. If I were to ask to my dog, what are you gonna do my love at 11? First of all, he doesn't understand 11. He doesn't understand what are you going to. And third, he looks at me like, you know, Fuck off, I want to sleep. Mm. So, given the fact that we act always based on certain goals, we tend to assume that, well, then goal must be the structure of everything. In its ontological existence. And we tend even to assume that then we must have an overarching goal. 
And if you are a believer, you say, oh, my goal is that of salvation. If you are a Confucian, you say, my goal is that to serve the state and the emperor. If you are, I don't know what, a, an American, your goal is that to serve America. <laughs> but, I mean, you can see how much of this talking of the overarching goal is just the result of the fact that the human being behaves according to goals. Goals that he fixes as he goes. Okay. So the safest bet, if one were to say, okay, let's say the minimal thing that we can possibly say about things. What is the minimal thing that we can say that they, uh, by minimal, I mean the one that assumes less. That they exist with a goal or that they just exist? That they just exist? The roles has no purpose. A philosopher, I don't remember who, used to say that the human being will be happy, will be free, when he will learn to be like the rose. So, going back to your question, Johannes, yeah, one can defend, uh, one can defend, indeed, uh, the hypothesis that God exists, we have to be careful, though, that when we do that, maybe at the point where we are already not talking anymore of the God of Revelation, but we are talking about a God that is, in all effects, a fiction of our mind. Mm. I mean, personally, I think I would disagree there, but I I think that's the metaphor in our discussion. But yeah, I mean, that would bring us yeah. somewhere else. Yes. Uh, so I don't want to, don't go, want to go In any case, if you're interested in this, you should read the, the objections that Pascal gathered against Descartes' conception of God. Mm. Okay. okay. All right. So uh, now that we, I, I hope we clarify this point, guys, because what, what I wanted to show to you and we stayed on it a bit longer, and now I'm gonna leave the floor for the presentation, okay? Uh, what I wanted to show to you is that when you listen to an argument, any argument, what you have to try to do is that to focus on the keyword and then ask yourself whether the keyword is used properly and how the how do you do that? By looking at the minimal definition of the keyword. All right. In this case, the minimal definition of the keyword machine is goal determined and built. Built, of course, with a goal in mind. Can we say that about living things? No. Hence, in which way can we call the machine? In no way. Dear Searle, dear Searle, who teaches at Stanford, but should go back to high school to learn how you argument. Mm. And by the way, guys, one thing that I hope you're going to learn throughout the semester and in the future is to be very, very wary of anything that comes up with the uh, with the ornaments of official high places when you hear someone that talks from harvard from oxford from la sorbonne and blah 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 then be wary chances are that this guy is there because he's an opportunistic not because he's a great thinker okay in any case, now let's move to the presentation. 
and um, and we uh, we then uh, see whether we have time for the for questions, or otherwise we continue next uh, Friday. I mean, uh, not this Friday. Wait, this Friday is already Chinese New Year, or we have class? Oh, it's Chinese New Year, bro. Yeah, but we have class, right? Uh, I think no classes because it's a public holiday. Ah. Uh, ah. Uh, okay. You sure? I guess so. Uh, I think I'm quite sure. Yeah. <laughs> Shit. So we we'll probably have to arrange. So why don't we do this then? Because I don't wanna. If we start the presentation now and then we're to to do it uh, next week again, uh, it's too too much time. Do you agree? Why don't we stop here for today? And the the group that uh, had to present this week is gonna present next week. Is that all right? As in, is it for the same content? Yeah, yeah, same content. Okay. Same content. I mean, same stuff. Because, because you know, guys, I mean, if we start presenting now, then next time that we're going to see each other is going to be on Monday. By the time, I promise you, your mind and my mind will have wandered somewhere else, as it is natural. As it is natural. I mean, in order for me to, uh, to keep myself more or less focused every time we meet, I need to write down, okay, last, uh, last time we finished talking about uh, Ferrero Rocher. So next time we're going to go into Lind. And blah 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 blah. Otherwise, I forget. Otherwise, I see you again, and I think, oh, we're talking about lasagna, and uh, let's talk about lasagna now. But it doesn't work that way, right? So if we do the presentation now by Monday, hey, good night. Like it's gonna be another universe. So let's do that. Let's stop here, unless you have questions or objections, or you want to go further into the argument, I, I, I would be happy to be here with you 15 more minutes since we have time. By the way, talking about the ones that have no goal, I can show you. That's my dog. That's what he does all day. He sleeps next to me. So you see, that's happiness. Learn to be as a dog. But then you wouldn't be, in, be able to enjoy all the things as a human being you can enjoy. Yeah, yeah no, that's true. I mean, I, uh, I'm happy to be a human being. However, when I see how my, my two dogs live, I'm like, well, you know, I wouldn't mind changing place for a month or so. All right, any question, guys? Observation? Um, I wanted to ask about the sort of the the way we've approached uh, Searle's usage of the word machines mm. and sort of questioning whether that was his intention when he was using the word, of course, uh, rather loosely. Because um, from the way I see it, perhaps he was using the word machines uh, more in the sense that uh, trying to get the point across that the mind uh, is a result of um, physical causes in that sense. Yeah, but and, uh, uh, yeah. yeah, but he does it uh, using a word that, as I said, assumes too much. Right. Okay. So, let's perhaps we could still explore the topic of um, the mind sort of being a result of physical causes, and as mm -hmm. of now, you know, ignoring the word machine, and like whether that is still something that is absurd. Well, uh, you know, uh, the, the mind as uh, physical, as the result of physical causes. That topic we started uh, approaching when we uh, reflected on, um, what's his name, on uh, Gabriel's uh, talk. We're going to see it again uh, in, the, in the discussion of the other videos, namely, uh, what's his name? Um, oh, God. Uh, Koch and uh, Dreyfus, right? Now, can we say that the mind is a result of physical causes? Well, we can say that, of course, you need something physical like the brain in order to have the mind. But we can also add that the brain is not enough and that you need something else physical in order to have the mind, namely the body. 
And that's what we're going to see with Brayfuse. Mm. Can I just see something? And then because even the body is not per se enough with the mind. It's necessary, but it's not sufficient. In other words, their soul falls into another argumentative uh, mistake. That is to say, he implicitly assumes that the brain, not even the body, the brain is a necessary and sufficient condition for the development of the mind. But this is highly questionable. In fact, it's untenable. Is completely untenable because of the arguments that Gabriel very reasonably brought. The brain, first of all, is not sufficient because it needs a body. It must be in a body. And not just in any body. In a body of a certain type. If I talk with you guys, or I did it with the other class, I don't remember, uh, about uh, the fact that human intelligence depends mostly on our hand. I talked uh, with you about that, right? So that's the body of a certain type. The human body is conformed in such a way as to allow the human being to perform certain operations which the body of a chimpanzee cannot perform. Okay? So having a brain is not enough. You need to have a body of a certain type in order to perform certain operations. And it's even unclear whether the brain conceives of the operations or the brain responds to certain stimuli that come from a body of a certain type. In other words, do I start manipulating things because, first of all, I come up with an image in my brain and then I start manipulate? or I come up with an image in my brain because I manipulate. Which causes which? This is an important question. Think of it this way. How many times has it, has it, has it happened to you that you came up with an idea of how to use something or what to do with something uh, after touching it, after holding it in a certain way. So, which one is the generator of the idea, the brain or the body? So, the brain is not sufficient, it needs a body. But then even a, a brain and a body are not sufficient for the development of mind. They are necessary, not sufficient. In fact, we saw that human beings that grow up in socially, uh, in social conditions that are not human or that are less than human, like child, children in orphanages, they don't develop a full mind. So again, Searle, also in that case, assumes too much and rests on assumptions that remain implicit and that the moment they're made explicit cannot be defended. I want to go back though to the question that uh, Yin Yu was asking, namely, for which purpose do we build AI? This is an interesting question. You knew, uh, in your opinion, why do we build AI? Uh, uh, 
I think it it depends. I I because like it's it's not the. It's like individuals or group of people are building AI. I think they are building AI like in different goals. It's not like in the same goals, right? Maybe some of them is just build it for some purpose, like help human to do some mm. some some work, or some of them are building AI just for to prove something to prove that. Uh, they can actually create intelligence just like a a god. So yeah, okay, I think so, I think it depends. It depends. You're perfectly right. So there are those who build AI and they call it AI improperly, just to help the human being doing certain things, right? So like in the past, we built uh, washing machines to help human beings washing things. Now we're building machines that are capable, for example, of uh, computing much, much faster than we can, of, uh, I don't know, uh, even do physical things that um, necessitate a lot of strength, more than the human being has, and, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, machines that can organize the working of other machines. Mm. Yes. All right. But this is not intelligence, unless you reduce the meaning of the word intelligence to something merely uh, functional and following a, a predetermined protocol. Mm, so the, the word intelligence in that sense is being used improperly. And by the way, the second part of this course is gonna be spent on trying to understand where this improper use of the word intelligence comes from. Because it's the result of a long cultural phenomenon whereby the human being has come to a certain understanding of himself. Okay, all the discourse, of, all the discourse, all the discourse around AI rests on a certain understanding that the human being has reached about himself at a certain point in history. So that's what we're going to understand in the second part of the semester. When it comes instead to those that want to uh, create or uh, try to create, to uh, build AI in order to prove that they can, uh, like, uh, like sort of gods, they can create uh, something intelligent, eh, then we are dealing with a completely different thing, right? Because at this point, they are trying to prove a point. They're trying to prove a point, the tenets of which, though, are not clear to them. In other words, they say, oh, I'm going to create something intelligent. Like Elon Musk in an interview that I saw, I, can, I cannot find anymore. He was saying that. The problem is that he never says what he means by intelligent. And at that point, whatever he's going to come up with, he can make it pass as success. But if you're trying to say, oh, I'm going to create something like the human being, okay, then you should know very well what the human being is, shouldn't you? Yes. I mean, if I tell you, oh, uh, look, uh, Union, uh, I'm going to make you something like Italian lasagna. And they're going to be like, what do you mean something like? Well, it's not exactly going to be lasagna because I don't have all the ingredients, but it's going to be very similar. What you will immediately think is that, well, this guy knows very well what Italian lasagna are. He knows it so well that he can imitate them. Right? Now, do these people who say that they're going to create something like the human being know what the human being is? I don't think so. If you, if you look even at what Searle says, and Searle doesn't think that we can yet create something similar to the human being, but eventually we could, right? All the analysis we did today of what Searle says shows that Searle doesn't know what the human being is.
And this question, by the way, is a very complex question. What is the human being? What, what are living things? It's not easy to answer. All right. Any other question? Can I go back to the, the earlier part where Kel was talking about how, yeah, or rather Cyril's point that um, the mind is the result of physical cause. Yeah. Like, yeah. I can, yeah. Because, okay, I'm coming from a different tradition, I would say. Like, uh, so there, there's a way to show that the mind is not the result of material cause and the way and I, I think I'm being a bit analytical here so the, the way is to look at uh, just think for a moment about our ideas mm -hmm. so our ideas in themselves like do not have any of the properties of a material thing so for example if I have the idea of an apple there mm -hmm. is no length no mass no yeah. color no smell of, in regards to the idea of the apple itself yeah. So, therefore, it, it cannot be said that the mind is caused by a material thing because mm -hmm. the, the idea that we have is nothing material at all. Yeah. Sorry, but if we follow Searle's logic, then let's say we represent information about an apple in bits, in binary. It doesn't have the color, it doesn't have um, sort of the the image of it, but it, it still captures that information. But in, in that case, then it's we as human being, we attribute the organization of the bits into that representation of an apple, to the idea of an apple. It's not that there is the, the idea of the apple in itself in the bits. But who's to say those bits are not um, an equivalent representation of what an idea is? No, the thing is that... Uh, because the idea is something synthetical. The idea is something uh, uh, holistic and synthetical. It's not the result of uh, bits and pieces uh, put together. That's why I was asking you last week whether you thought that uh, a dog sees a mountain and we see a mountain. The dog doesn't see a mountain. The dog doesn't know anything about mountains. We do. Why? And yet, from the point of view of the senses, the dog sees pretty much what I see. So as Johannes is saying, there is something else in the idea that precedes the data. Right, and I think what Saul might be saying is that the, the difference between the dog and us is that when we see a mountain, there is a certain meaning that we give to that mountain, whereas the dog doesn't have that. And, and, and that's not as yeah, that's, that's the idea. Yeah, yeah. that's, that's and, precisely immaterial already. Exactly. So yeah. I think what Searle is saying is that can meaning be captured in information? And no, because information are information because of meaning. Information means something that is shaped into. Shaped into what? Into a shape that you must already have. Otherwise you don't shape anything into anything. But can information be shaped into more, com more complex information? No, the thing like, is like... Yeah, you can connect ideas, yes. You can connect ideas and you come, you come up with clusters of ideas. So if, if like we have, so I think the most basic information is, is um, stuff that comes through the senses, which no, is when the you... most basic information is what we already carry with ourselves. In other words, it's not that the human being uh, gets stuff from outside and then it organizes it according to God knows what. The human being, whenever it approaches the outside, it approaches it in, a, in an already uh, sense-determined way. Think of this. When, when you were a kid, your parents taught you 
the word for tree, but they didn't teach you what a tree was. You knew what a tree was. You just didn't know the word for it. What does this tell you if you reflect on it? It tells you that whatever we approach, we approach knowing that it is something. We might not know the word for it. We might not know what its use could be, but we approach it as something. Now, approaching things as something implies meaning. It's possible only because of meaning. The dog doesn't approach what surrounds it as something. The dog is there bombarded by stimuli when, it, when it's awake and completely at rest when it's at rest. So, the human being doesn't have as primary uh, knowledge what comes through the senses. What comes through the senses in the human being is already shaped by meaning. Now, do you want to use a Kantian slash uh, Aristotelian uh, vocabulary? whatever the human being encounters, he encounters it through the mediation of logos. And there is no way around it. Assuming the opposite is an assumption. Why? And I can, I can show it to you even experien experientially. Have you ever heard pure noise? Pure noise. Have you heard pure noise? Yeah. Undefined. You have. Pure, pure noise meaning? Pure uh, noise. Like a noise sound wave? Or? Yeah. Have you ever? I guess. No, you haven't. I can tell you that right now, right now I'm hearing, okay, air conditioning, then a chirping that much probably must come from one of your computers. And then a car downstairs, which judging from the noise must be some kind of track. What does it show you? That even noise, the human being perceives it according to a certain known mold. So I never hear pure noise. I hear the noise of a track. I hear the noise of a chirping that might be either a bird or a computer. Given the fact that there are no birds here, it must be a computer. Now I'm hearing another noise, which is the scratching of my dog in the other room, which is different from the scratching of my cat. Pure noise, we never hear pure noise. In order to hear pure noise, we should be able to completely dissociate what we perceive through our senses from meaning, which we can't. This is what I mean when we say that we live constantly, we filter everything, we pre-filter everything through logos. We can't get out of it. There is no way to get out of it. Whereas other creatures don't live in Logos. And I, I, can, I can have no idea on how a dog perceives things. Surely I know that he doesn't filter them through meaning. I know that because I see how they behave. Now, how they perceive them that's unfathomable for us.
So again, Searle there makes huge assumptions that once you start scratching them are indefendable. And look, guys, I didn't come to these objections with Sir because I'm a genius. On the contrary, I'm very slow. I was able to come to these objections because I spent most of my life just reading, not writing, reading, not getting into debates, just reading. And in particular, these things that I'm telling you about the human being living through logos, uh, how did I understand it? Well, I can list you a few things. Plato, Aristotle first, Emil Lask, one of the most important ones that I read to understand this, Heidegger, uh, Husserl. This is, I'm, I'm telling you this to say, to, 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 to make you see the importance of reading and reading the right stuff. And how do you know what the right stuff is? Is the stuff that goes directly to the core of the problems. Whatever goes around problems, whatever escapes the kernel of the problem, leave it aside. Now between uh, Searle and Gabriel, who's the one who reaches the kernel of the problem? Gabriel. And how does he do so? By analyzing very carefully terms. What does, Searle do, uh, what does Searle do? He does something correctly, but given the fact that his old premises are wrong and he doesn't address the kernel of concepts, he ends up uh, spoiling whatever correct thing he had gone on to. So in other words, comparing philosophers as we're doing is an exercise for you to learn how to think, how to think straight. And thinking straight means, first of all, checking your assumptions. All right. Now, let's stop here for today because it's 10 and I think you have to go for another class. Uh, I'll see you uh, next week. So uh, happy Chinese New Year. Wait, how do you say in Chinese? My wife keeps teaching me, but I forget. Kong Si Fa Tai. Right? Kong Si Fa Tai. And uh, see you on Monday. Thank you, bro. Bye, guys. Thank you, bro. Thanks, bro. Thank you, bro. Thank you, bro. Bye. Bye.